Okay, it's one o'clock, um, and I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Welcome to the February 21st, 2023 meeting of the Landmark Preservation Commission. Let's go ahead and start with introductions. Hi, my name is Larry Sykes. I'm an architect and I was appointed or nominated by History Colorado. Hello, I'm Gary Petrie. I'm an architect and I was nominated by the Denver Planning Board. Hi, I'm Julie Johnson. I'm a, a preservation project manager and I was nominated by the community at large. I'm Kelly Wemple. I'm an architect and I was nominated by the American Institute of Architects. I'm George Dennis, um, retired law enforcement and I was nominated by History Colorado. I'm Eric Horzel. I'm an architectural historian and preservation consultant nominated by the community at large. I'm Ann Wattenberg. I'm an architect nominated by the American Institute of Architects. All right. Um, then, if you want to proceed just now, or do we move forward with the meeting record? All other items to, to address right now? Yes. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. It's fine to go okay. forward and then it wouldn't matter. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we do have two meeting records up for approval today, January 31st and February 7th. Do commissioners have any comments on those two meeting records? If not, would someone like to make a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the minutes, the meeting records as presented for January 31st and February 7th. Great. Thank you, Julie and uh, Gary for the second. I'll call for the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Same. All right, motion passes. So the records are approved. Um, you can see up on the screen if you're joining us by like Zoom that there are some audio tips. Uh, so you can go ahead and check your audio settings. Uh, we do recommend you add the background noise suppression. That does help we hear with uh, noises like shuffling papers and things like that um, to keep those to a minimum. If you're going to be presenting or providing a comment later, uh, when it's your turn to speak, you can go ahead and unmute. Um, and you can do that using the microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and there are some other settings that you can look at in your additional options um, on the microphone. So uh, be sure to test your microphone and speakers and adjust as needed. And if you have any challenges, um, feel free to switch to uh, phoning in or you know, let Landmark know if you are having trouble. Okay, at the beginning of every Landmark meeting, we like to provide some opportunity for public comment. So this is not on any matter that will be on the hearing or design review agenda today. This is for preservation matters in general. So if there's anyone on the line who would like to provide a public comment, um, now's the time to do so. So you can use the hand raise button you're joining us by computer or dial star nine if you're joining us by phone. Oh, yeah. And is anyone joining us by phone? Uh, it doesn't look like it now. Okay. Great. All right. If there are no public comments, we'll go ahead and move forward. There's nothing on our consent agenda today. So we do have a public hearing, and I know that we have a recusal. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to recuse myself. Great. All right. Well, here. Thank you, Anne. Um, so, that Anne is receiving herself, but since she is the applicant, she's not leaving the room. <laughs> that would be difficult. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and move into our hearing. Uh, up on the screen, you'll see the public hearing process. Um, I'll go ahead and announce the project, and uh, staff will introduce the application and provide their recommendation, after which we'll hear from the applicant, who will have up to 10 minutes to present. Uh, and then we'll open things up for public comments. So the public comment period for hearings is three minutes per person. And uh, at that time, you'll be able to use the hand raise button uh, if you're joining us virtually. And if you're, uh, everyone's virtual. Okay, so <laughs> that works. All right, after we've heard all public comments, the commission will move into deliberation and vote. So um, we've got a hearing for Project number 2020, or sorry, 2023L-001 at 618 Great. All right, so today, um, first item will be the designation application of 618 South Monroe Way. 
This is an owner supported designation brought forth by our very own Ann Blomberg. Uh, the property is the New Chow residence, named after the architect and first owner, William New Chow. Okay. Uh, the property is located in the Belcaro neighborhood, just south of Cherry Creek. This would be the second landmark in the Belcaro neighborhood, um, the other being the Fitzsampton, just about two blocks south of the Chow residence. You can see that very large red um, shape to the southeast of this location. The property is located in our current District 10, which is represented by Councilman Chris Hines. The existing zoning is a suburban single unit, and the zoning would not be affected by the designation, and the designation would not affect the zoning of um, the surrounding area or any surrounding property. Uh, the proposed boundaries for the designation are the existing zone lot, as you can see up the screen, and that's the west 18 feet of lot 32 and the east 57 feet of lot 31, lot 3 of the Stokes Place Division. And then here's an aerial view of the property um, showing the residential character of the surrounding area. The criteria for designating a Denver landmark um, are laid out in Chapter 30 of the Denver Revised Municipal Code. And to be considered a Denver landmark, a property or a district must, must maintain its historic integrity. It must be more than 30 years old or be of exceptional importance. It must meet at least three of 10 significant criteria, and the LCC must consider the property's relationship to the historic context. Um, so the application has argued that the um, proposed designation meets three of 10 criteria, uh, illustrated in orange here. Um, and staff have done a review of the project and believe that um, the property does meet uh, the criteria. And so now we're gonna go through all the criteria as well as the other information that the um, applicant provided in the application. So the first criteria is criteria A, um, that the property has a direct association with the historical development of the city. The mutual residence has a direct association with the post-war development patterns seen in Denver and cities across the United States. The population of Denver almost tripled in the post-war period and um, to accommodate new housing for new residents, more than 5,000 housing residents or houses were constructed. New neighborhoods were laid out with winding streets in contrast to the um, rigid north-south alignment of previous historic districts or previous districts. Um, and the majority of new homes were designed with low-slung ranch-style houses with informal open plans, which is in contrast to the relatively rigid four-square brick bungalows of the late 19th and 20th centuries. William Wu Chow's 1953 design for his family home at 618 South Monroe Bay is reflective of these changes and these wider cells and patterns. The design shares many of the streamlined attributes of the ranch house, which was prevalent in the style um, of homes built during the post war boom, and it emphasized simplicity, privacy, and informality. And it was built primarily on one level with an open floor plan, large windows, and exterior cladding that was informal and specific. The majority of Denver's post war residences were starter homes, as was um, 618 South Bay. Producing homes that were within the buying power of the new residents, many of them returning veterans and thus um, constrained in what they could afford, required rethinking building elements with a view towards producing material and labor costs. Major changes included, included building the entire home on one floor and flat on grade um, without a basement or a second floor, using open floor plans so that public rooms could serve several purposes, um, and having smaller bedrooms for children and greater connections to outside spaces. Mooshaw residence at 618 South and Railway embodies these design elements. As Mooshaw himself noted, modern homes have been compressed by high costs. But I still, but I feel they can still have an air of spaciousness, despite a case such as. So interrelated to these development patterns is the mid-century modern um, architectural style, and 
This building at 618 South Middle Way embodies the distinctive visible characteristics of an architectural style or type, being the mid-century London style. This style focused on simplified geometric design elements connected indoor and outdoor space, an open floor plan, and simplified building materials with little as And although this is not a typical ranch style house that is synonymous with the post war building boom, um, the building uses the same design principles in a unique, playful way that makes the house stand out as a new country modern design. The home uses geometric volumes, in this case, a triangle rather than a rectangle, as a more traditional ranch home would have used. And launching off from that triangular shape, the house uses exaggerated lines to create an A frame almost three just ago. Large overhanging E's, another hallmark of the mid century modern style, protect the large expanses of windows, shading them from direct sun, but still allowing large amounts of light into the building. This also serves to blur the lines between the indoor and outdoor spaces of the site. The property also uses simple materials, primarily brick and cedar shingle, in concert with the glass. The very textures of these materials provide visual interest in the place of decorative features common on earlier architectural styles. The 1975 garage edition, which you can see just on the very left of this photo with the big door, um, was also designed by William Michel, and it uses similar design principles that drove the design of the primary structure. The addition is low flung and boxy and is clad in vertical wood siding. The symbol form does not detract from the design of the original structure, but instead recalls the early site features like the brick wall you see um, on the right of this picture and an early bedroom patio on the east elevation, which is kind of And finally, um, the reference at 618 South Blue Railway meets Criterion D as a significant example of the work of the recognized architect, William Mucho. Uh, and Mucho lived, not only designed, but he lived in the home with his family until 1971. And here's a picture um, provided by the applicant that shows Mucho and his wife um, at work in their boss office in the house. So William Mucho was born in Denver, Colorado in 1922 and died in 1981. He earned a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Illinois in 1946 and a Master's of Architecture and Urban Planning from Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan in 1948. Wichita's firm worked on a broad range of architectural projects in schools, churches, single, family, single and multifamily residences, office buildings, financial institutions, and municipal buildings. From 1950 to 1991, his firm designed 833 projects, and they were awarded 35 AIA awards. In 1968, Mucho was elected a fellow to the American Institute of Architects. And some of his more prominent commercial and civic designs include the 1967 Federal Reserve Bank, the 1975 uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield office building, and the Galleria at the Denver Center for the the property at 618 South Blue Road is a significant example of Mucho's residential work. Although Mucho designed hundreds of buildings during his career, he primarily focused on larger scale buildings, and his single family residential work is gone largely undocumented. This property is a unique example of his design philosophy expressed in a residential context, and it was also a notable award winning design in its own time. In May of 1967, it was one of 25 homes published in the National Architectural Records Records Home Issue. And the jury stated, a three-dimensional approach developing the structure along with the plan gives unusual spaciousness and visibility for an inexpensive house on the small plot. So we find staff have found that the application and the property meet three out of the 10 significant criteria. So now we'll look at some of the other criteria that are required for them. Um, as appropriate for a property proposed for designation, the historic context is strongly interrelated to both the areas of significance and the period of significance. The property is directly related to the post-war development patterns of Denver and is a unique architectural expression of the design principles of the new century modern style. Likewise, the period of significance for the structure is 1954 to 1957, or 1975, excuse me encompassing its construction and ownership by the Moonshaw family 
Through the design and construction of the garage addition and the reorientation of the entrance from uh, the east to the west elevation. These changes were designed by Mucho, uh, although he did sell the property in 1921. Uh, chapter 30 also requires that a property maintain its historic integrity. And integrity is defined um, as the ability of the structure or district to convey its historic, geographical, architectural, or cultural significance, recognized as belonging to its own particular time, place, and numbers. History and we in historic preservation use seven aspects to determine historic integrity, um, including location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So the house retains a remarkably high degree of integrity. The original features and architectural elements, including large areas of grass, glass, uh, exaggerated A frame roof with cedar shingles, and site features are intact. Uh, helping to remain maintain the integrity of design, workmanship, and materials. The alterations to the property, including the garage addition and reorientation of the entrance, were designed by that architect and do not detract from the original design. But a small non historic addition on the east side of the building, approximately where the original entrance is located, was located, is not contributing to the structure, but it does not um, detract from the building. And the property is still located in the residential neighborhood of um, El Caro, fronting onto when you're away. And as such, it maintains integrity of location, setting, feeling, design, association. Uh, so as of February 21st, uh, this slide is wrong. We actually have two public comments. One came in pretty late in the day. Um, both of those public comments are on the commissioner table, and we have copies saved for the record. And both public comments are in favor of this designation. Therefore, staff finds that the application for designation at 618 South Way successfully meets the criteria laid out in Chapter 30 of the DRMC. The property is over 30 years of age and meets three of 10 significant criteria that is related to historic context of the case. Therefore, staff is recommending that LDC approves this designation application and awards it. Are there any questions for staff? Great. Then let's hear from the applicant. It's on. Uh, how do I use um, the but, Yeah. That's my question. Are you just are you trying to do this or am I? Uh, I usually do that. You'll do it. Okay. Is that all right? That way you're not having to sound going back and forth. All right. Um, hold on a second. I get a disclaimer. Yeah. Well, for yeah. Excellent. My name is Ann Lockenberg, and I live at 618 South Conway. Okay. Uh, William Muchow was born in Denver, Colorado in 1922. His father, C. Floyd Muchow, was in the terracotta business, beginning as a laborer of the Denver Terracotta Company, rising to be its president 50 years later. Muchow graduated from North Denver High School, attended Columbia University and the University of Notre Dame. In 1942, he entered the military, where he served for four years. He returned to college at the University of Illinois in 1946, earning a Bachelor of Science in Architecture. He then attended Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan and graduated with a Master of Architecture from a planning degree. While at Cranbrook, Wuchow studied under the internationally acclaimed architect, Elio Saarinen. Next. All right. Yep. Um, in 1949, Wuchow was awarded the Rome Prize and subsequently traveled in Europe. It was also at Cranbrook that Wichon met and married fellow architecture student Priscilla Williams. Um, and here they're seen in the law studio at 618 South Monroe Way. Returning to Denver in 1949, Wichon worked for several firms, including Fisher and Fisher, before founding Wichon Associate Architects in 1950. Between 1946 and 1965, Denver's population almost tripled. Many of the new residents were veterans like Wu Chow, who came to Denver to start civilian life. And like Wu Chow, they needed affordable starter homes, and the result was a building boom. Next. Uh, 618 South Monroe Way, where Wu Chow chose to build his family home, is a Stokes Place addition, 
one of the newly formed posts in our neighborhood, platted from dairy farmland in 1951. South Monroe Way is a curvilinear street, a configuration recommended by the 1950 Urban Land Institute for Communities Builders Handbook. There were only two or three homes on the block when 618 South Monroe Way was constructed. The neighborhood did not completely fill in until the 1960s. Concerned about construction and design quality of housing produced during the post-war building boom, led developers and homeowner groups to utilize covenants and deed restrictions as a way of preserving and protecting qualities they felt most important and positive in their subdivision. Standard restrictions address the home size, style, material, roof configuration, setback, etc. Stokes Place adopted their protective covenants on September 10, 1952. Much of the commentary about the 1954 home centered on the design, on which out design response to these regulations, although it should be noted that the extant copy of the covenants was <coughs> with minimal restrictions. In the mid-century, Americans embraced modernism and home design, both for its building form and for the lifestyle it implied. Constructed in 1954, 618 South Monroe Way shares many of the streamlined attributes of the ranch house. Which, the, which was the prevalent style of home built during the post war period in Denver. This was family life without servants, a life of simplicity, privacy, and informality. Living space was primarily on one level with an open floor plan, large windows without moldings or applied decoration, exterior cladding with each formal rustic material. Next step. This 18 South Monroe Way epitomized these qualities. Two years after its construction, the home was featured as the home of the month in Denver Post Empire Magazine January edition. In 1957, when Mucha was 36 years old, he was contacted by the Denver Post who informed him that his house was selected as one of 25 designs nationally to be featured in the record home edition of Architectural Records. According to the Post, the North high school graduate ricocheted between shock and pleasure when informed he hit the nation's top 25. The architectural record jury stated a three-dimensional approach to developing the structure along with the plan gives unusual spaciousness and livability for an in inexpensive house on a small plot. The design continued to receive notice and awards. Among others, it was given an award of merit in October 1957 issue of Sunset Magazine, a Western a Western Home Award from the American Institute of Architects in 1958. It was featured in both Los Angeles Times Home Magazine and the New York Times in 1957. In his own words, Muchau described the design. Rather than adding elevations to floor plans, this design is based on the concept of enclosing space with structure, a three-dimensional approach integrating the plan into a predetermined structural system gives a unique open quality to the resulting design. While strictly adhering to the covenants, an exaggerated high-pitched roof gives the effect, desired effect of two stories, while the low roof overhang helps to bring the house into scale with its neighbors, as well as screening the interior from view and lending the house a warm, shingled look. Meanwhile, by the late 1950s, the Muchau firm was already achieving prominence and was busy primarily with commercial and civic projects. And although Mucha was not part of the architect developer partnerships that resulted in many of Denver's post war communities, he seems to have done some exploration into mass produced housing using 618 South Monroe Way's A frame design as a prototype. An additional version of this design was constructed in Denver's post war Wilshire neighborhood. Another version of the design is shown in the on the 1957 cover of Western Architecture. And the Article's text mentioned that the builder went on to design and sell, sell several other homes at the same time. In 1971, Muchaus moved and sold the home to Howard Cohn, and then it was sold again in 1975 to Arthur Dion. Dion commissioned Muchau to design an addition and also commissioned a landscape plan for prominent landscape architect James Silverstein Lee. The addition is a flat, simple, is a flat, simple, single story clad uh, box clad in tongue and roof, wood siding, and painted white. It contains a garage, additional bedroom, and the main entrance to the house, which is moved from the east side. The entrance itself is understated without an awning or porch. Next. 
Meanwhile, the Muchow office continues to thrive. Next. The firm worked on a broad range of architectural projects that included schools, churches, single and multifamily residences, office buildings, financial institutions, municipal and recreational facilities. Many of the designs are still prominent features of downtown Denver, including the 1968 Federal Reserve Branch Bank, the 1974 Park Central, the 1975 Blue Cross Blue Shield office building, the 1978 Garage and Gallery of the Denver Center for the People. From 1950 to 1991, his firm designed 833 projects and was awarded 35 AIA awards. Puchow's design work was nationally recognized with numerous awards, and in 1968, Puchow was selected as a fellow to the American Institute of Architects. Work in his office inspired many protégés who ranked among, among Denver's most successful late 20th century architects. A December 15, 1982 quote from the Daily Journal summarized his influence. Puchow is probably the most widely known architect in the region. His name is synonymous with after the 1980s, since they came South Monroe Way changed hands several times. Many minor changes were made, sheds built into the roof over things, the addition of machines to plastic siding, and the landscape plan deteriorated to the point of the street view of the home was secured. The current owners <coughs> purchased the property in 2006 and restored it. In 2017, 618 South Monroe Way was given a mayor's design award. <laughs> the application stated in part, the design proves that Mr. Wichow's clean and efficient approach remains a fresh and delightful solution to the small home. Thank you. And if you want to stay up here, I'll be clear of questions. <laughs> yeah, are there any questions? Or uh, yeah. Quick question. Um, just thinking of the um, the criteria that you selected, did you consider criteria E of uh, containing elements of design, engineering, materials, craftsmanship, or artistic merit uh, that represent a significant innovation or technical achievement? We just <laughs> <laughs> just curious about that. I think we might have discussed it. We might. Have <laughs> it just yeah, it seems like the post and beam, the approach to post and beam was pretty yes. unique and yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? That's all. All right, thank you. Um, is there anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment on this application? Now's the time to do so. Please raise your hand. See them raise. Great. Well, we, we did have the two um, letters of support that we received that are on that table. Thanks. Um, so, if there are no public comments, then I'm going to go ahead and close. Oh, uh, I don't think it's a... You did open it. I did. Okay. Yes.
uh, trying to search for a word. It, it, the typical is it's very rigid and very um, very sharp, and and this just seems to negate that. I think part of it is the landscaping, part of it is the shape, but it's very pleasant to look at and has been awarded and copied all over the place. So I would absolutely support it. Designation for, for this, except with all that glass, where are you going to hang the plaque? Yeah, I would agree with everything that's been said. I think it's a very thorough application. And, uh, you know, we normally have these where it's like, oh, is it really a research architecture or a significant example of that? And this is like very yeah. clear. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that, you know, the architects was very significant and that this in particular, his poem was very significant and um, example of his work and clearly, and it, you know, is a home run for embodying the mid-century modern style. And, uh, yeah, I didn't even think before reading the application about the development, the post-war development, but I thought that was a very good argument as well. So I think it meets the criteria. Uh, and retains excellent integrity. I mean, you look at it now, and it looks just, I mean, there's the addition, but it's set back, and, and that's during the period of significance, so it's part of the significance of the structure. So, uh, yeah, I support this for sure. Awesome. Well, who's going to make the motion then? Madam Chair, I will. Great. Madam Chair, I move to recommend approval and forward to the City Council the landmark designation of 618 South Monroe Lane, application number 2023L-001, based on the landmark ordinance criteria A, C, and D, citing as finding a fact for this recommendation in the application form of a testimony on the February 14, 2023 staff report. Sure. Thank you, Julie, for the motion, and Gary for seconding. All for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? All right. Motion passes, and the project moves forward to the city council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it forward. Yeah. It's nice to get some new countries in. I feel like oh, so many of our historic districts don't capture that time period. Yeah. Same neighborhood. Yeah. Also, I have to say, as a personal note, it was fun to see that I didn't realize Nusha had won a um, Rome Prize. I used to work at the American Academy in Rome, the New York headquarters, and that he's from Colorado, and I'm from Col you know, it's just like, oh, cool. <laughs>
the majority of these homes have had their windows replaced. Um, this one is uh, no exception to that. Um, so I just wanted to note that as it's relevant to our review of the accessories law. Um, so to accommodate the proposed accessory dwelling unit, a non-historic um, garage will be demolished. Here you can see that garage, um, a fairly large structure, but in uh, historic, um, located in the rear of the property. The existing fencing will remain and be slightly modified to accommodate the accessory dwelling unit. Um, so here is the existing site plan. Uh, you can see that the property is significantly um, inset from the side street and South Lincoln Street. Um, and here is the proposed accessory dwelling unit. It is a 853 square foot accessory dwelling unit. Um, it is placed to the north of, um, sorry, it is placed five feet from the north uh, property line. This is required by zoning um, for the setback for that side interior. So it can't be any closer to the north property line. Um, however, staff do have some concerns over this ADU as the footprint um, is a little bit wider than the existing one-story primary structure, and therefore um, it does have some massing that is visible on South Lincoln Street uh, due to the um, width of the building footprint. Um, this accessory dwelling unit will also have access um, off of South Lincoln Street, um, a new uh, uh, Stair step will be constructed into the existing retaining wall, and then a new gate will be constructed in the fence that's existing, and then it will have a patio um, space that is covered by a pergola structure that you can see here in the site plan. Um, so here is the proposed uh, floor plan and roof plan for this um, accessory dwelling unit. Um, so the ground floor will be used as a two-car garage and storage space, um, and then just some uh, some minor access um, with a stair up to the habitable living space. The footprint of the ADU is 26 feet by 32 feet and six inches. And the ADU height is 24 um, feet in height, which does meet the zone code requirements for this building form. It will have a mini split that is located on the roof of the first floor, which is slightly larger than the habitable living uh, space above. Um, so here is the proposed uh, west elevation, which is also the South uh, Lincoln Street elevation. Um, these, this ADU will have, again, a uh, covered patio space and then a recessed entrance with a um, Spanish-style arched door um, and then a pergola structure. Um, staff are very concerned about these elements as we feel that it adds uh, visual prominence along South Lincoln Street. and. Um, creates a connection to the street and no longer gives the appearance of the ADU having a secondary appearance to the primary structure um, and more have a, uh, as a uh, primary structure appearance versus a accessory dwelling unit appearance. Um, the ADU is two stories in height. Um, however, the commission has approved two-story um, accessory dwelling units on properties with uh, one-story structures. Um, this is a way to add additional uh, programming to the site without modifying the existing residents. So we are supportive of this height. Again, our biggest concern is over the width and the visual prominence of this um, ADU along South Lincoln Street with the patio space and pergola structure um, along South Lincoln Street. However, um, as you can see in these, uh, these elevations and this uh, rendering, there is an existing retaining wall and there will be a six foot privacy fence. Um, so I think it would be good for the commission to discuss if this is sufficient enough to mitigate that, um, that appearance of it looking like a primary structure on the line. Um, this is the alley elevation. Uh, the um, structure will have a um, garage that looks like a carriage style door. Uh, we are a little concerned that the carriage house style door is not appropriate for the mission revival style structure um, and would recommend something that is more um, appropriate to the uh, to the design of the structure. Um, the majority of the windows for this structure are going to be um, double hung, but there are a few treatments as well um, I can see here on this alley elevation. And then it will have a smooth finished stucco as you can see here just to match the finish of the primary structure. 
Um, this is the elevation that faces uh, the primary structure. This is the interior lot elevation. Um, again, an arch uh, door that is recessed into the opening. Um, and then also on this structure, you will see a single hung uh, fiberglass door um, towards the interior lot elevation. Uh, staff do feel that the arch door is a little more ornate than the uh, doors on the existing structure, which are not arched in any way. Um, so we would recommend the fiberglass door design, which is a half light with panels below um, as shown in elevation. But there are some material um, discrepancies on what that style door looks like. Again, um, the material specifications just show a half light door with no panels um, below. So we would encourage it to be uh, the square door with the half light and two panels below as opposed to the two arch doors that are proposed along South Lincoln Street as these are more ornate than the doors on the existing uh, structure. Um, it will have a metal parapet cap. Um, again, you can see those double hung windows and uh, a casement windows, and then it will have a pergola trellis structure here on this elevation um, that is flush to the wall. Um, again, you can see that patio here in this image really well along with that pergola structure. Uh, the windows here are fiberglass composite, which are appropriate um, to this construction. And then this is the east elevation. Um, this elevation, along with the other elevations adjacent to entries, will have light fixtures. Here is the proposed light fixture. There will be two fixtures along this elevation just to provide some security lighting uh, for this walkway as there is a gate along the alley here. Um, so I do have a fixture shown here. And then you can see the recess. Um, in terms of how this ADU does fit in with the surrounding historic context, um, again, this is a small uh, historic district, so it's only about a block um, with six structures, uh, and then across the alley and across the street is all outside of the historic district. Uh, but in terms of the ADU height, it is not significantly taller than the primary structure. It's about five feet taller, and again, the condition has approved two-story the three dwelling units on um, lots with historic one-story primary structures. Um, ADUs are used by right in the zone district, and they are allowed to be this tall. Um, again, staff don't have concerns over the height of the ADU. It's more the footprint of the ADU and the visibility of the pergola along uh, South Lincoln Street. So just to look to see what that would look like, um, here is some renderings of that proposed ADU in context with the single story structure. Again, staff are very concerned about um, the dwelling unit not appearing secondary to the primary structure and having that strong connection to the street with that patio and pergola and the walkway. Um, so those are where our concerns are coming from in terms of is this subordinate to the surrounding historic context. I will say that this is a small district and the neighbors um, Four of the neighbors who live in the district have all written letters of support for this ADU, and then there are two letters of support for this ADU outside of the district. There are some images of the surrounding context, again, which is not historic um, in your packet if you want to look at what that surrounding non-historic context is. Um, and then here are just some additional renderings of that ADU. Um, we did encourage the applicant to move the patio program for the ADU um, to the interior lot, uh, but they do have an existing pergola there, which you can kind of see in those renderings that are on the screen here. And they are trying to create some separate living space um, for their mother who uh, will be inhabiting this ADU. Um, however, staff, again, do, do feel like it's too much programming and therefore recommending denial of this ADU at this time. Um, and then we do have some minor concerns over some of the design choices, um, such as the carriage uh, style doors on the garage and the arch doors on the um, the entry. Are there any questions for staff? Um, sorry, as I already stated this, is there an R and O in that area? No. Okay. So oh, there is an R and O. They didn't set up for design with you. Okay. <laughs> well, there's, there's not a design review. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Yes. Yes. 
What's the when they can sign up for the line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, promote the applicant. Not sure which one it is, so I'm taking a little. Okay. Okay, great. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself when you're ready. If there's multiple people speaking, um, you can all, we'll just need names and addresses for anyone who's speaking during your 10 minute period. You can get started whenever you're ready. Am I going to share the screen? To... There we go. Am I going to share the screen or are you going to share the screen for the presentation? Uh, so no, we don't have a presentation. We've got we've got the presentation that's up here. The okay. put together, but we didn't one from you. Okay, I have one that I sent back to Brittany last night. Um, also, that's not within our time frame, meaning our policy for presentation. Yeah, pr presentations need to be submitted in advance, and it sounds like that one wasn't received. Yeah, yeah. In advance. Um, but we have the materials that were presented during the staff presentation. If you'd like us to pull any of those up, okay. Well, um, I will start here. If you can go down to, I'm going to run through my presentation here, which is somewhat different from what we've got here. Um, okay. Can you just start with your name and address, please? Yeah, sorry. This is Jeff Baker, uh, 2422 Champ Street. Um, I'm representing the applicant uh, or the uh, homeowner, which is Scott and Dana Nelson. And this is for, they're building this for Scott's mother, Kathy Nelson. Um, so there is a page that shows the side view. It was it's page 10, I believe, in mine, but um, that one right there that you just were on. Yeah, we're going to pause you real fast. So your presentation materials are just the application materials. The commission has your application. Yeah. You can reference page numbers in your submittal, and they can look at those pages. Right. Yeah. I know, but I added a bunch of materials into for the presentation. Um, but apparently you didn't get that last night. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna have to reference off of what I've got just cause. So yeah, so the page that shows that side rendering um, is where we can go ahead and start. It's got the circled garage on it, <clears throat> which is was page 10 in mine, but uh, So it? no, it's the one that has a two color images on the top with a circle garage. The Google Earth and Google Street. It was kind of the side perspective from Lincoln. Um, so you're gonna go down a little bit. You got, as you can see that is a large garage on the back side there. Most of the other garages are smaller. Um, so there was a side perspective that was a, a drawing that showed the height of the house and from Lincoln black and white, and she had referenced it when she went through it. Um, keep going. That one. Okay, so this is, uh, so that garage is, um, current garage is sitting 14 feet, six inches from the west property line. The proposed two-story ADU will be located 18 feet from the property line. So um, showing here the house, she has it actually at 13 feet and the ADU at 24 feet, but we're going to 21 feet as you can see uh, here. So we did reduce the massing uh, height-wise down to 21 feet or from 24 feet 
um, in consideration with the single story bungalow district. Um, so the house is 16 foot six inches and you're seeing it's about four and a half foot difference there. Um, and then you can go on to the next one. Um, you can see it's heavily vegetated there from that view. In these images, we removed the, pick, the trees to show for the visibility of the ADU on that. You can also see how we set back as much as possible on the Lincoln side and from the front of the property to the furthest back corner to reduce that massing as well. Um, let's see here, go on next. Let's see what you're gonna show next. <clears throat> Okay, and then do you have her staff report? I just want to address the comments through that. So as she mentioned, we do have uh, letters of support from all but one of the other houses in the district. That new resident is out of town and has not been able to be contacted. Or else we feel we probably would have had support there as well. Um, and then if you go down to her staff report, so yeah, I just want to correct it. It's not 24 feet high, it's 21. Um, and it's one and a half stories according to zoning because we have a 25% reduction on the upper level. Staff also suggested that we move the building all the way to the east property line. We moved it seven foot, six inches to the east. This is a five, five foot from the property line on the setback. We stopped here because the neighbors and 105 East Vassar sewer lines are connected on 105 East Vassar's property. The neighbor's garage is right on the property line. It would be near impossible to construct this building right up against the neighbor's garage. It would be a possible service either of the exteriors of those structures. We'd also like to avoid the 20 to 30K shoring expenses that would kill this project. The upper level setback also reduces the mass and feel from the ground. We reduce the height once again from 24 feet, which is allowed by zoning to 21 feet. So we are only technically four foot taller than the existing 17 foot garage. Um, that side patio reads as a side patio. Many ADU entrances are on the side, um, not on the front porch uh, due to the fencing height. So you've got a three foot retaining wall with a six foot fence. So from the right of way, street and sidewalk effectively, you've got a nine foot tall fence that's gonna be blocking the view of this. It is on the corner lot, which there's nothing we can do about that for visibility. Um, it'll be, the view will be similar of the, of the existing larger garage. Uh, as far as the doors go, these are really simplified down um, compared to what we started with. These doors, the arches and the use of the exterior stucco material are the only nod to the character defining features of the Spanish revival architecture on the CDU. We feel like these features are a modern interpretation of the architecture of the district and the building would never be misinterpreted as an original historic structure. We removed all the other character defining features that staff requested us to remove. Another thing I wanted to show is that the fact that detached ADUs must reside in the rear 35% of the lot of a zone lot are make them subordinate to the primary dwelling, regardless of square footage. That is from new ADU recommendations coming out of Denver zoning right now. Um, as far as the garage door goes and the two, the panel door, we can change that to a panel door, no problem. That was just a mistake as far as that rendering goes. And then the garage, uh, door, it's facing the alley. It's not going to be seen from the front uh, unit and uh, from the front of the, uh, the house. And it's in, it's in an alley. So we address the footprint size and reduce that to 853. Um, being that there's already a side entrance uh, that exists on the property, we are not adding anything that detracts or changes from the, the view from the right of way, which has again, a fence top of nine feet above the sidewalk. You won't be able to see the ADU entrance from the sidewalk or the street. This district is only six houses and they all have garages. And this is addressing the secondary structure comment of being very small in the district. I agree with you because they're all garages. And so by building form, they are smaller in size and if ADUs are allowed to be added to the district, which they are by uh, zoning, um, the building standard form would be larger in the rear 35 percent so for future adus that would be a comparison i guess too and then just again we're not at 13 feet on the house it's 16 6 and the adu won't be 24 feet it'll only be 21 feet um we did move the adu to the east as far as possible to that property line we don't we do not feel like the adu is overtaking the primary house 
the existing garage projects past the house. And oh. um, go ahead. Anyhow, we are feeling we are adding gentle density to for family housing to the district. We're not changing the character of the district, but rather giving a gentle nod to the character defining features of this unique district. That's all I have, and I believe Scott would like to speak next. Hello, uh, this is Scott Nelson. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, there we go. Here's the video. Uh, my name's Scott. I'm the property owner along with my wife, Dana. This is my mom, Kathy. Um, a little bit. <laughs> We're, uh, we kind of came up with this idea um, just trying to find my mom a new place to live. Um, she is in good health and only 75, but she's uh, nearly blind. And so it's been tough to help her out as much as possible with uh, just normal day-to-day -day living. And so the senior living options we looked into um, are just outrageously expensive. Um, and also just still too far away from, from where we live, from this house. So uh, we were exploring this idea, knowing that we're zoned for it and um, think it would be a great a great fit for, for our family. So um, my wife and I were of the original homeowners that were involved in spearheading this designation or this landmark designation district. Um, so we absolutely wanna see the style and the, um, the history of these homes stay intact. And I feel like our architect and designers have been doing a good job with that. Um, we just need to get some help from, from you guys as the committee uh, to help push this forward. Um, so let us know if you have any questions on what we can do to, to help make this work. Um, Mom, did you want to say anything? Well, I just would, I really appreciate the fact that my son and daughter-in-law are willing to. Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I really appreciate the fact that my son and daughter-in-law are willing to uh, provide a place for me to live. I live in a two-story, four-bedroom house, which is entirely too big for me, and I need a smaller place where I can feel safe and secure because my eyesight is fading. I can see very little now, and uh, it's only going to get worse. So I would really appreciate uh, all the the uh, time and effort you've put into this and uh, help us move forward with, with this place so I can feel safe for the rest of my life. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. All right. Um, are there any questions for the applicants? Sure. All right. Sounds like there aren't any questions. So thank you all for your time. We'll go ahead and open it up for public comments. If there's anyone on the line who would like to make a comment on this project, please use the hand raise button at this time. Okay. Right. And any recap before we move into deliberation, Brittany? I do have recap. Um, it does look like I misread the plans and the ADU is 21 feet, six inches in height, as noted on page 16. Um, apologies, there is a 24 foot dimension um, on page 10. Um, that did confuse me, but I do see that it is not uh, that dimension. Um, in terms of the placement on the lot, again, um, as I mentioned in the staff um, presentation, there is a five foot uh, setback between it and the neighboring property. That is as close as it can get per zoning, as I noted in the staff um, presentation and staff report. Um, so we aren't requiring it to violate that side interior setback. Um, however, we do have concerns over the overall width of the ADU and the applicant in this presentation did mention um, a text amendment that is going through currently for accessory dwelling units. Um, the um, amendment is not officially adopted and there are some um, <clears throat> proposals to make ADUs uh, allowable in more areas of the city and easier to go through the building permit process. However, um, properties that are in landmark historic districts may uh, always be subject to more restrictions than zoning 
allows. So that is something to consider um, as you're reviewing this as well. And I don't believe I have any more. Yeah. I had one follow-up question for staff. Um, with the, the fence, if that were to be removed in the future, would that require permit or review by landmark? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, if there are no further questions for staff, let's go ahead and move into deliberation. Um, right. And make sure to project our speakers out front. So, commissioners, how do you feel this did or did not meet design guidelines? Yeah, there were not any comments. Yep, I'm glad you asked though. <laughs> I guess since I started talking, I'll chip in. Yeah, I really um, you know, kind of struggle with this one. I feel that the, I understand staff's concern about the width of the footprint. Um, on the other hand, when I look at the overall mass, um, you know, the second story of it um, does fall within the width of the the primary residence and it comes across as you know as much as a two-story and I think as pretty subordinate and I think particularly helpful toward that subordination is the fact that the second story is from the Lincoln side as well as the faster side set back from the first floor and so Narrowing the width of the footprint as it touches the ground, I worry would then reduce the amount of setback you get and make it actually feel larger in a way, unless they were to also narrow the second story. But yeah, curious what other commissioners think. Well, um, I think my initial reaction was um, in support of the staff recommendation, but it seems like the staff's primary objection has to do with subordination. And um, as I looked at the um, elevations and the um, uh, Three-dimensional uh, representations. Um, I think I'm more sympathetic to the um, to the proposal. Um, I guess I wonder, you know, what conditions we might place on an approval if we come to a consensus on it. And, and um, uh, but I I would support. Approval being open to new conditions and not necessarily knowing what those conditions are. Um, yeah, I I, um, I agree with what you and Larry have said, Gary. That I, I, it's hard for me to see how it could be kind of more subordinate in, in massing and scale um, without significantly um, making it much smaller and kind of becoming more vertical, I think is what you were getting at, Larry, with um, not having that setback. And so I, I guess I was kind of approaching it the same way as what could there, what conditions could there be that might help with it? And for me, it's maybe not so much the subordination because again, it's a struggle to see um, how, how much more successful it could be subordinate to this small house to begin with, um, other than its orientation to the street, um, which it is on a side lot, corner lot, I should say. Um, we have the fence there that is, um, and the retaining wall that is blocking um, a significant amount of how it's visible from the street. Uh, I think the only thing that kind of come to mind was the arched doorways 
as being um, at least, you know, it's hard to know in real life what how visible those would be, but it looks like maybe the top of the arches might be visible. However, <laughs> when I think about the arches, staff is correct that the windows are not arched, but the covered porch at the front does have arched. And it and in some ways to remove the arches, I think kind of removes this tying into the the main building. So I'm actually hesitant to suggest that those should be done away with. Um, so this is all me just thinking out loud. Um, Brittany, do you wanna? I don't have concerns over the porch recess having an arch. It's the door specifically having an arch mm -hmm. because the doors on the primary structure are not arch. Mm -hmm. so just for clarity, thank you. Um, and so certainly, I mean, I could see it might be slightly awkward to have, not, I guess, awkward, but could have a condition of non-arched doors um, if we wanted to kind of follow that thinking. I, I agree with everything that's been said. Honestly, I'm still okay with the design as submitted only because the doors aren't really visible, it's the arch openings that are, and I do think that that is a nod to the historic primary structure, which our guidelines support, you know? Um, and I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, they have kind of, you know, done the one-story portion, like, closer to the street, right, and, and then stepped up. So I agree with everything that's been said about, I, I'm not sure how much more subordinate you can make an ADU. And this is really interesting because um, it's a one block district. Right. So this isn't even visible from any, like you're kind of viewing the district almost just from, I understand it's on a public street, so you can still see it in public right away, but it's kind of like the whole historic context is kind of at that front. I, I don't know. It, um, with with the fence and the retaining wall, I'm less concerned, I guess, about, about the visibility of this. And I think we have approved ADUs in other districts like Chris Park, um, where it's been a one-story primary structure and a two-story ADU at the back. And I mean, just because they're on a corner lot, I feel like that's, you know, they're doing everything they can to push it to the east to mitigate that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think that the arch doors, I mean, I support that condition if that's the way everybody wants to go because I do see the guideline that's associated with it. I just don't think they're very visible from the public right of way. Well, no, I'm sure they're not very visible, but the other, it, because the main, the original house doesn't have them, it does distinguish this issue from the other house. Sure. So I I would support it either way, but I guess in, in defense of the doors, um, that's kind of hard. It's a good the differentiation. Yeah. I think it fails subordination just from the from the perspective and the applications renderings. And I think also that I, I think there's a a recreating of, of historic features. Uh, where the pergola is, the wood coming out of the side of the wall, like the front of the house, um, the sort of faux adobe language, right? I have that. Um, and so I'm very inclined to uh, agree with staff and also you know, not try to design the, the project for the, the, I think the, the kindest way to take our suggestions, but maybe there's a little more slimming on I guess I, I don't understand, like the primary house doesn't have a part of a structure like that. No, there, yeah, but I think it has. And it doesn't have any of the details the primary house does. It doesn't have the clay tiles, it doesn't have the brick and parapet. So I think they have simplified. It doesn't have recesses with wall plane around window openings. 
So, I mean, I feel like they've simplified as much as you can. It's mm -hmm. stuck a box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> the only thing they have is a couple of show short. things. And, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 yeah, I guess that wood structure, which they have a wood structure in their backyard that's completely separate from the primary residence. Probably is non historic. I don't know. Um, but in, in my mind, I don't think that they've overly replicated any historic features. In defense of the applicant, one viewpoint. <laughs> yeah, and I guess for the record, um, there was uh, staff had the concern about the program of the patio on the side. And again, yeah, I don't feel that that necessarily because of the tall fence and because of um, the fact that it's, you know, helping create a space for whoever's using that ADU um, to not have to kind of live in the primary house's yard space. I think it kind of makes a lot of sense programmatically. It doesn't feel too packed in. So uh, we talked a bit about the doors. We talked about the arch trunk openings and the massing coordination. We haven't talked about the garage doors. Did anyone have any comments on that? That was another uh, point that staff made. So I um, I think one of the concerns was that the carriage style didn't match kind of the overall architectural style, but I actually don't think it contradicts it. <laughs> um, that that kind of diagonal wood is definitely seen in um, Spanish colonial mission revival. I mean, it's very reminiscent of like the latias um, on the ceilings of those type of buildings. So I I didn't necessarily take issue with garage doors. Yeah, I'm here coming up. Yeah, I agree, especially since it's at the back of the lot as well and the alley. Um. Okay, so there's, let's see, I'm just trying to see. So we've got six people, we need five to pass the motion. It sounds like for the most part, uh, most people are leaning towards approval, um, with, with one exception. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe some people who feel a condition might be necessary about the doors, maybe not, We're kind of wavered on that. Does someone want to try a motion? I'm, I'm kind of seeing some nodding heads. I think maybe we've reached consensus and hit all the points in the staff race. Just keep in mind that we do need to revisit the guidelines associated with the motion. Um, so I actually, I think um, the guidelines as listed and might be appropriate. Um, okay. It was, if we were to deny it, some of those would have to be removed. Um, but I think it actually works if we were to approve it. Um, which I'm happy to, I'll try a motion. I think we were just talking about approval. Yep. Without yeah, I think so. Um, I also just want to thank both the applicant and staff for all your work on this and recommendations. Um, I move to approve application number 2023-COA-040 for the new accessory dwelling unit at 105 East Vassar Avenue as per design guidelines 4.1, 4.8, 4.18 through 4.20, 5.6, 5.18, Character defining features for the Vassar School Bungalow Historic District. Presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Thank you, Gary, for seconding. There's no further discussion. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
that right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Set a moment of oh god, did I pull it the wrong? <laughs> Pro -cal. Okay, thank you. Eight twenty two Ray Street is a colonial revival residence constructed in nineteen forty one. It is located within the Morgan subdivision. Um so you can see here fairly simple um colonial revival house. I want to just uh, partially show this to give you an idea of the setting. Uh, the this application is for a rear addition. Uh, the rear addition will be entirely to the rear of the house. Uh, you can see that the house, looking at this to the left, is pretty close. So there's a really small setback there. So I don't think it's really going to have a rear addition would have any visibility there. But there is a larger side yard there on the other side to the right. So I think that will be, you know, that from the street there would be some visibility on that side. So just to keep that in mind. I pushed it. I'm waiting to see if it's gonna. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here, just to give you some context, uh, the original house uh, kind of and the dishes that you see there that's the existing on the left, and then what is proposed on the right. Um, the sandboard maps show that the historic house. Footprint was a T plan with a front side gabled section parallel to the street and a cross gabled extension to the rear. So you can see that there on the left. Um, and then there was also a historic gable roof uh, garage that was attached, and that was an original attached garage. You can see there then on there's also um, two additions that have also been added that are kind of filling in there. Um, on either side of that T. Uh, so then you have there on the right the proposed. Um, so the applicant is proposing uh, to demolish the non historic additions along with the rear cross gable and the attached garage. Um, so you can see that there uh, on the right. So you'd have one large addition that extends across, two story addition that extends across the rear of the property, um, then a smaller connector, and then a attached garage. So here just then the additional kind of since the property here are the drawings of the existing so you can see that side gable portion that is facing the street. That is the portion of the house that will be retained. Everything else to the rear is being proposed for demolition, um, including that cross section, the cross gable, and then the garage, and um, some later additions as well. Uh, so, here is concept of what is being proposed uh, for the rear. So the applicant is proposing to have a two-story addition to the rear. Um, the addition will be clad in horizontal wood siding with a four-inch reveal. A decorative brick wall with a shaped parapet will be located at the center of the east wall of the addition. An inset porch supported by columns is located at the southeast corner of the addition. Uh, staff finds the placement of the addition to be appropriate, but we do have some concerns with some of the designs and materials. Sorry, right, now I can't even get there. Really finicky. Uh, so here is just additionally another drawing there that you can see that rear uh, brick wall that is proposed. Um, that finds the decorative brick wall with a shaped parapet is overly complex for a historic house that is a simple and restrained colonial revival design. We find that that brick wall is more neat than the original structure, which is very simple with detailing. Um, and so we find that it does not meet guideline 3.4.D, which states that do not design an addition to be more or neat than the original structure. Uh, the staff would recommend that, that the brick section at the rear uh, be removed and that it just be or simple. Um, here you see then just the other side. You can see the 
side view, the two-story addition there, the rear a one-story connector. Um, so both of those can be clad in wood horizontal siding. And then you can see there the garage, attached garage, the rear, which is the clad in brick. Um, one other concern of staff is the proposed roofing of the garage. So the the applicant is proposing to use a concrete tile designed to replicate slate at the roof of the garage. Um, currently, the roof of the house is had an asphalt shingle. Um, staff would recommend that the roof of the garage match that of the house rather than introducing a new roof product that does not appear to historically relate to the property. Um, or it was not really typical for a garage you know, roofing material within the district. Uh, so here just kind of wrap up some of our concerns with the design that really kind of flex the decorative brick and stone parapet wall at the rear. We do also have some concerns with the columns that are proposed on the rear porch. The applicant is proposing to use polyurethane columns. Landmark generally does not allow polyurethane porch components and would recommend that the columns be wood or fiberglass. Um, additional information should also be provided on uh, those, like called out as poly here, but there weren't, weren't any manufacturer details or kind of any specifications included for those, and recommend that those be included with the other material information. Uh, we also then have some concerns with the uh, windows on the inset. Um, so, not all windows are inset two inches from the wall plane. Um, this shows that at the stucco, um, or sorry, at the siding, <laughs> um, that uh, the windows are only set three quarters of an inch. Um, so guideline 3.f.3.7.f point point states that uh, windows should be inset a minimum of two inches from the wall plane, um, and that's not the case here. Um, so another concern, then you can see then also. Uh, the slate uh, are concrete designed to look like slate uh, that is a concern. So to summarize, uh, staff have concerns with the decorative uh, brick parapet. We have concerns um, with the column material and the lack of detail. We have concerns with the roofing material. Um, also, we have concerns with the window inset. Uh, we are lacking information on a lot of the doors and no door and window schedule is included. Um, it does seem, you know, looking at this, there's a fair amount of variety and some of the size and configuration of the various windows on the property. So we do think due to that complexity, it would be very helpful to have a window schedule. They clearly called out all the different configurations in something um, and size. And then generally just to add additional information then to the material pages, um, make sure it includes all the columns, doors, and all the trim, um, and also all the patio material to the proposed patio on uh, page L13 along with the other materials. Uh, so while some of these materials could be addressed as simple conditions, the staff felt that the design of the brick wall at the rear is more than just that's kind of more of a design issue and not a simple condition. Um, so staff is recommending denial, um, but we do feel like addressing some of these, you know, with that removed and the other material conditions addressed, this is something that could just, you know, maybe come back on the consent agenda. Um, the commission we feel like it's not that far off, but we have, have those concerns that I have stated. Are there any questions? I have a question. Can you go to the window details? I notice the one on the right is drawn improperly because there's no blind stop. stop. If, if there was a blind stop, which would be three quarters of an inch, that would set the upper sash back an inch and a half. Would that be an acceptable inset? I'm not, I'm not arguing with your comment. I'm just saying if yes, that window I mean, had been drawn properly, it might have met that requirement. Okay. Yes. I, okay. So, 
But, but isn't the requirement there too? The requirement is two inches. I feel like an inch and a half is close enough that the commission could decide that that's sufficient, but I think that is up to the commission to decide since the guy is fine. In a, in a wood frame wall like that, historically, that's what it would have been about an inch and a half. And to set it back more, it's a, it's a guideline requirement, but it would not it would not be consistent with historic detailing. Um, and possibly create some issues you really wouldn't want to create in terms of window green. That's a good point. Any other questions for staff? That's just one other window question. Were there any concerns about them using simulated divided light, uh, or was that successful? Um, we, I mean, often we allow those in the neighborhood, like country club that tend to be have a little bit more. This is Morgan's where we rarely do any design review. It kind of has a similar context to country club, so I didn't you know, call this out as a major concern. Um, but yeah, so because that was my thought process there. Um, I have a question about, so the existing two-story portion of the back that's being demolished, does it? That's historic. Right? That is historic okay. based on the Sanborn map. That is a historic part of the house. And that doesn't um, that doesn't trigger a public hearing. It's not over forty percent. Correct. Okay. And okay. so I included all the calculations yeah. in the staff report, and I think the demolition of that steer um, cross cable would definitely be considered as demolishing historic material. Whether or not you count the garage as historic, since it was part of the original footprint, I think that's a little bit more of a gray area that's up to the commission to decide. But if you're looking at those, if you included the garage, since it was part of the original footprint, then that means the total wall demolition would be 35% and the total roof demolition would be 38%. Okay. And, um, and including the garage or not? Not including the garage. Yeah. At least that's going off the map when I added up all the numbers on the applicant's report. I'm not saying that that's shorter. The garage is a one story. Oh, so, okay. so if you look at it plan, it looks like it'd be more. But right. Yeah. So, um, and and I just want to make sure you're understanding. Staff didn't have issues with it because all of the rear you can't see it from the public right away. Right. That portion of the. Yeah, I mean, not ideal, but it is for the rear. So, and I didn't see on the floor plan. Maybe this is a question for the applicant. Uh, in which case, just let me know. But um, I, I did not see like how far the new walls of the addition are going to be inset from the existing. It yeah. looks like, you know, at the basement they're kind of aligned the foundations, so that there is some amount of, you know, shifts in the wall plane. Yes. When, our, when we looked at the guideline revisions, we were really looking at it that where we kind of all used to always interpret the guidelines as saying that there had to be an offset. When we did the revised guidelines, we really looked at that is there should either be an offset or a change in material. Okay. So in this case, it's changing from brick to siding. Gotcha. And so we kind of felt like brick to siding was enough. That was a clear okay. differentiation then that was going to clearly differentiate the addition. Gotcha. Are there any other questions for staff? All right. Get the applicant promoted. Excuse me, promoted. How do you should we have with? I mean, I think that one's fine. It shows kind of both sides of okay. Thank you. Right. Right. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, when you're ready, go ahead and unmute yourself. Please start with your name and address for the record. You have up to 10 minutes. John Mattingly, 517 yeah. Bayod, Denver, 80209. <clears throat> Thanks, Abby, for the thorough write-up. We had to go back and forth a few times on this one. Uh, but just to point out, the majority of things that Abigail had, had mentioned were to some degree drafting errors. And Gary, you did catch that detail accurately on our windows. There was one section that was on sheet L014 where there was a three-quarter inch detail called out that was should have been an inch and a half instead of three quarters and so it's actually drawn right it's just labeled incorrectly so 
the intent there is to have that offset, and especially where we have the siding meeting the window casing. We like that to be proud regardless. And so you do get that inch and a half reveal. So we'll need to clean that up. And sorry that it wasn't that way to begin with because it would have saved Abigail a lot of time. Um, same is true with the garage roofing material. There was some talk in a design meeting about, I guess I should start this, this leads to the whole idea of the that parapet. We kind of went on this British colonial journey with this house, with the clients. It's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and in that discussion, some slate was brought to mind and uh, found its way onto the proposed drawings, but we'd actually prefer an asphalt like the original house to maintain that knife edge return that we're seeing on the gable end and to simplify that material. So I'm you know, absolutely amenable to changing that to asphalt. I think it's more appropriate. Um, there is a four inch offset between the brick and the siding, uh, which I really like because it helps us handle the, that what is being perceived as a flat parapet wall on the siding addition. Uh, gives us a better termination up top, but I do like the relief it provides because uh, we really want that to represent itself as an addition to the historic structure. And I think the four inch offset helps that. And as far as the column is concerned, uh, we, we've used these fiberglass columns and they're called polyclassic just because they're durable, but it is a square column. We can easily frame that in millwork. It would just, it just creates a mitered edge that wears poorly over time. And so I like those columns because they're durable and they, they paint very well and you can't tell once they're painted, but you can easily change that to a millwork um, and the design intent wouldn't change at all. The, the detailing would stay the same. And so um, we could easily make that adjustment. And then just understanding the addition and where we went with it was the idea, you know, again, to keep that the presentation from the street, which you would see. And if anyone was to catch an eye shot down the side, then you would see the offset and the siding. And, you know, a, a parapeted sided wall like this is pretty common in, in British colonial architecture, even in, in colon American colonial revival architecture. And so it seemed like the natural way to handle that. I added that parapet in the back because the original building has that, that gabled volume that comes off in that T format. I have to admit, when I first walked in the house, I thought it was an addition because it's been destroyed inside. There's a mute, you know, there was an addition done. And when they did that, they kind of wrecked all the interior wall connections. And so it feels very um, renovated in poor taste. And so I made the assumption that that was an addition because it felt like one, a really poorly done addition. And then when I went outside and noticed that it was inside of an original skeleton, but it had just been mutated. That's where I, I just didn't pay any regard to it. You can't see it from the street, but I do like the idea of it. And that's why I put that parapet wall in the middle off the center of the building to give a nod back to that. And uh, the design of it, you know, the, the, the sketch going into the computer got a little mistranslated and a little bit too fairy tale. I would agree with Abigail for the uh, more simplified colonial revival flavor of this house, but I would propose, and, and I've actually done this already, a simplified uh, masonry, a flat gable masonry parapet. And so it's not a you know pointed uh, gable. It actually has a small section of flat, but it's a little taller and we have just sharp angled sides. So it's a very common thing in British architecture to see that. And so and it would not be overly decorative and it gives us a nice termination point between the siding and that, and it brings structure to the back of the building, you know, so, and just architecturally speaking, to sit outside and see this composition, I feel like it does, it does add some strength and structure to it, some architecture, so it's not just a sided box in the back, and so I'd love the chance to, I'm actually looking at this drawing now, we just didn't get it submitted in time to, to use it as a cue, uh, but I'd love the chance to present that um, as a condition to see if we couldn't keep that sense of, of masonry. It is a full uh, eight inch wall. So it reads as structural wall and not just brick up the back. Um, and I've got it located on the floor plan in that area that is that living space inside. And so it helps that the hyphen on the left read more like a hyphen and the area on the right also like a hyphen and less like a big giant sided addition. So that was my play on making it more architectural. But I agree with Abigail that the um, more Moorish fluted item that's up there now is out of character. So I'd like a chance to present this simplified version of a, of a gable parapet because it, it really helps the connections and adds some architecture to the back of the house. And in the Morgan's district, it is that is a high architecture district, um, really fun stuff over there. And so I don't feel like we'd be overpowering it if we did that, uh, but just definitely simplifying like Abigail suggested. Um, 
We talked about the offset and the materiality of it. Adding that gable also gives me an attic volume to run a mechanical system, which would be very helpful. Um, but I don't know if I'm missing anything else. Um, we did point out the four inch offset. So it was a tricky design. We're inside of the rear 35, uh, outside of the rear 35 with a very deep setback. And so um, the intent here was to stay out of the demolition and do a design that stayed inside the front 65 for the two story area. We did do a flat parapet wall and the connector between the building and the garage. Um, even though the original structure was attached, it's pretty common to see detached garages, if not some level of subordination between the garage and the house. And I felt like going flat on that roof led the garage to feel a little bit more carriage house like and be more subordinate to the main structure. So that was the thinking behind that. Uh, and it also helps with our window play. Um, but uh, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, I think um, all of that being considered, if there's a way for us to submit that, assuming we could find our way to the consent agenda for Abigail's recommendation, I'd love to be able to just, my only caveat would be, we meet all of our other requirements. I just want to have a chance to present that simplified parapeted gable in the back because I really think it helps the building. Uh, so anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think we can receive new material. We have to make a deliberation based on what we received today. So I don't think that we can see the design that you're referring to, unfortunately. But, um, you know, it's, it's good to know where you're headed with it and, and how you would respond to the staff comments that have been made in the brief. Are there any questions for the applicant? Just a few of the things. Gary, that you Okay. 
I think the intent is because the lower sash will have their more recess. Yeah, usually. Yeah, okay. Which gets to, I think that's yeah. your point, right? Like, okay. Yeah. Then you do meet that yeah. criteria. Yeah, it's drawn other than what you know, the thing had it there. But you know, that, yeah. Like it works. So that's a good point. That's not even an exception. Like, if we were to be saying that, we're not, yeah, contradicting the guidelines anyway. But I think it also was then me. Take that point to the out of the denial. We we made a motion for denial. Take that guideline out of that. Well, well, I do think they mentioned that the the drawings needed. There was some mislabeling, so I think okay. they do still need updated window yeah. drawings that accurately show and accurately label. Okay. And they'll have our deliberation. Yeah, like if we're doing a denial, they can you know address. It. What we said is not an issue with All right. Um, so those were a couple of the kind of more detailed things that I thought, uh, and, and then maybe we should talk about those columns, the the materiality of the Yeah, um, I was trying to find the guideline that specifically says no poly or polyurethane, or is is that is it an interpretation about durability? Or is there actually a specific? We tell no, like tra traditionally we allowed fiberglass and we've allowed wood. I was at least we allowed fiberglass for new construction. So if you're replacing the historic column, we yeah. only allow wood. Yeah. For new, we've allowed fiberglass or we've allowed wood. I'm a little unclear on what this is because John also mentioned fiberglass. Yeah, so yeah. I think we maybe just need more information on what exactly the product is. Typically, we kind of looked at like. Vinyl or poly is not, you know, matching, you know, as far as the guideline says about materials that are similar in, a, you know, appearance and to historic materials or similar, you know, in durability is where we typically haven't allowed poly or vinyl. So, like, 3.6G, that new materials yes. are big, right? yes. like similar to historic materials. So, maybe an interpretation that, as you say, maybe just more information to understand. Yeah. What exactly material is. Really, yeah. The reason I brought it up is that there are a couple of manufacturers who do lots of replication of what used to be made in wood, but they usually use a high density polyurethane, which gets painted like wood. Um, and I'm not certain that it's any less durable than doing it in wood poorly. <laughs> um, but okay, it, it, you clarified it enough for me. So it sounds like, um, you know, we just need more information on what that product is to make a determination as to whether that's acceptable. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we zoom out. I know I went kind of into the weeds, but I just want to hit those pieces. Um, maybe we zoom out a bit to the overall design of the edition, or do we even start? I, I guess I asked the question about, you know, did staff have any concerns about demolition and it being at the rear? I um, I think since none of it is really uh, that historic portion that's being demolished is visible, none of that's visible from the public right away. I'm I'm okay with it. I was just wondering because I was kind of surprised it seemed like you know a lot of historic material being lost. Did anyone have any concerns with the amount of demolition? Um, it, it definitely was something I was grappling with at first. Um, I feel like there have been a few country club projects, though, where we have approved similar projects of um, removal of smaller, not additions, but smaller portions of, um, from, like, the main mass of a house that has then been replaced with a much larger addition, but it's all in the rear. Um, and because we're talking about a historic district and um, that visibility from the street, it feels like they're it, meeting the guidelines. There's more flexibility here. Um, I um, we can definitely keep talking about this. I would just like to say that as far as the shaped parapet on the, um, I'm glad to hear that there's kind of 
further thoughts on that, I would just like to make the point that this is not British architecture. <laughs> this is colonial revival from the 1940s. Like that is the context that you really should be working with. Um, it sounds like you know there was some fun in, in thinking about what would British architecture be, but that is not the context of this house. So just keep that in mind um, when you're rethinking that. Um, and no, that was a good segue. I mean, I just wanted to make sure no one else was concerned about demolition. I was the one who brought up the comment. I figured everyone else was okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I think there was a more egregious demolition project that yeah. occurred in the past that actually destroyed the integrity of that original area. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So let's talk about the addition. So, yeah, I think that that brick portion is the, is the biggest mm -hmm. part of the design that we probably had issue with. I, I had the same issue. Um, any other comments on that, on the addition? No, I agree with that. I, yeah, I think this one's hard because they could address it in so many ways. So I think we're looking at a denial, and I see nodding heads. So yeah, I think you know staff had that right because you could just there are so many ways you could address that. But how it how it is in the application, I just feel it's very like false front yeah. <laughs> architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in, in the back, yeah, and it just isn't consistent with the historical. Um, I, I kind of, uh, I'm interested to see what the applicant is envisioning there because I, my gut was more that having it all be siding in the back would be more compatible um, because it just really feels like a tacked on false front right now with just this, this brick in mm -hmm. the middle. Um, but it sounds like you come up with kind of a solution where maybe it, it fits and it doesn't feel like just a tacked on portion. I wasn't really following because we don't have a visual of what he's planning, but, um, you know, there's probably many ways you can address uh, that back facade. We'll just have to see. I mean, I, I could see that the change in materials kind of helping to break up the mass yeah, of the back, which I think is a good goal. Um, so I'm not necessarily against it, but I yeah, but this way. how it's presented. It did give me some pause to yeah, hear that they want to continue with having things kind of in what seems like almost three separate parts at the rear because the the front facade of the historic house is so simple that it feels like any level of complexity beyond what's going on in the front, I would have a difficult time feeling is appropriate as an addition. Um, and then I guess there's another element that wasn't really brought up by staff, but that kind of caught my eye and, you know, less of a concern, I suppose, because it's the garage, but the kind of side gable on the garage, uh, it's kind of got this front to back gable roof structure, and then a side gable that is the full width of the side. Um, that feels also to be overly complex to be, you know, in the context of the colonial revival. So I think my overall feeling is just that everything needs to be simplified a lot <laughs> to yeah. feel subordinate to uh, the original house and to be within the guidelines. Feedback that might be helpful to the applicant or staff as they look at three designs here. Um, I know you brought up, Larry, the divided lights. Um, did you have any, does anyone have any issues with that? Okay. Right. Who would like to make a, mo a motion? I'll make a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to deny application number 2023-COA-042 for the addition at 822 Ray Street as per design guidelines 
3.4 through 3.9, 4.18 and 4.19, character defined features for the Morgan Subdivision Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Thank you, Larry, for motion, and George for seconding. cheered you guys up a little bit. I don't know why my guy decided to not do a leaf, but did his face instead for our sample. So, but either way, it kind of shows characteristics. Um, 
Yeah, and to answer your question, that corbel, uh, that piece did fall down to the sidewalk and had about 150 pounds worth of uh, pigeon droppings inside of it. So pretty disastrous, right? If someone was, luckily no one was down below when that happened. Um, we're proposing this material. Um, a, it's affordable, it's extremely durable, um, weather resistant, and it's also very lightweight. So the backing on this entire cornice system is some steel frame, mostly wood frame. Um, we can't support a true concrete fiber going back. I'm nervous to even support uh, new sheet metal going back onto it right now. So this is our kind of lightweight alternative product to the sheet metal, essentially. Um, this will also be completely sealed, um, kind of mildew, bug, rot resistant. Um, it won't allow any birds to get inside of there either. And that's that's essentially it on this. I mean, I don't have a lot. It's not it's not that much going on here, but yeah, that's why that's we're using right this material. That's quite all right. You don't have to build the ten minutes. That's totally yeah. fine. <laughs> Um, great. Are there any questions for the applicant? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Could you just state your name and address for the record, please? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. I'm Derek Reese. I'm project manager with uh, Summit Sealants and Restoration. And do you have like a business address you could give us? Yeah. Our uh, Denver address is uh, 2000 West Quincy Avenue. And that's Inglewood 80110. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions? Yeah. Any questions about this material? <laughs> I guess I just have one question for the applicant. Um, as far as outdoor exposure of this material, have you spoken with the company about precedence that they have of this being used outdoors? Yeah, absolutely. That's its primary use. So the epoxy okay. shell that's over the face of the foam, that's why it has that epoxy coating over it, is so, yeah, weathering, it just doesn't affect it. Um, yeah, we've taken hammers to this too, this mask, and it just doesn't do anything to it. So durability is pretty extreme. Yeah. Do they warrant, like have a warranty for, or it's like an expected lifespan for this. I don't know how long this has been available on the market. Yeah, I mean, all, yeah, we can get a warranty from them. I'm sure they'll probably run, you know, the typical one to two year manufacturer thing or whatever it is. Um, we'll throw a five to 10 year on top of this product after we install and we'll pass it along to Denver Dry. Well, I, I have a question. Um, so you are actually fabricating the replacement parts using these products. So there's not a separate manufacturer that's Correct. making the replacement plaques, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And that was another thing too. I mean, we prefer a lot of stuff to happen in-house. We have the actual corbel piece that's in-house, the bracket right now, and that's how we're going to get our shape. It's just going to be a reverse direct mold. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone on the line who has a comment on this project? Please use the hand raise button. So, no hands going up. All right. Um, yeah, there we go. All right, then let's move into celebration. What is everybody's thoughts? And can you need to head back? We've got it over here. I don't want to pass it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Becca said she was going to like make a hat or hair or something. <laughs> it's very Victorian. 
Well, maybe somebody wants it back. <laughs> no, we need, we're actually supposed to have it keep it. Oh, for, never mind. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, future yeah. Halloween Friday. Well, uh, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like it makes a lot of sense from the standpoint of, you know, it, there was so much weight from the yeah. kitchen species previously, and that's going to be eliminated animals can't really get into here. So that's a good thing. And if it's lighter weight, it looks like they've come up with a good solution for attachment. Um, I mean, I'm not familiar using this product, but it seems as though they've kind of done everything they can to justify its durability. I'd be comfortable supporting it. Yeah, I'm, I'm good to start. Yeah, I agree. There's something always a little disconcerting about foam being used as like architectural yeah. elements, but I think this is a really good case of where it actually does make a lot of sense. The coating certainly seems to hold the detail that's going to be required. Yeah. yeah. You can see the... Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of worried about it. You know, thinking and it is six stories up. This is mm -hmm. something yeah. that people are right. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty well protected from the brain. Gary, I feel like you're our material expert. Do you have well, I, no? Um, no, I agree with the. Uh, I mean, this type of technology has been used for this kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, I was looking at the, the manufacturer. I'm familiar with the uh, called Smooth On. They make a number of products used in restoration um, um, of this type. So the only concern I have, which I think uh, some of the sealants will be dealing with, is is the corbel going to have the same density as this model? Because I wouldn't consider this lightweight, but I think there's yeah, I think there's a variety of different densities of foam that can be used under the hard case. And so um, and they they seem to be very aware of issues of supporting the weight. I'm glad to hear you say that because I was thinking like if I True, like a true size corbel that doesn't strip the yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 I wasn't off. Like yeah. 150 pounds. Of, yeah. And I mean, some sealants does a lot of preservation work, so I feel like they probably. Oh, was that not loud enough? Some sealants does a lot of preservation work, so I feel like they probably have. I mean, if they they're comfortable with this material, hopefully that's something that. Okay, well, it sounds like we've reached consensus. So, who wants to make the motion? Madam Chair, I'll make the motion. Thanks, Julie. I move to approve application number 2023 COA 022 for the replacement corbels at 1555 California Street as per design guideline 2.4C. Presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the certificate. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? All right. Motion passes unanimously and the project is approved. All right. The next project we have on design review is 2023-COA-041, and that's at 2288 South Milwaukee Street. So this is for 2288 South Milwaukee Street, and this is the Jackson Willard Taylor House. This was constructed in 1902. The house is an individual landmark and has no period of significance um, that was included in the designation application. Uh, on the left here, you can see photos of the existing brick structure and the existing detached garage at the top right. Um, at the right, you can see the property's location at the corner of South Milwaukee Street and East Highway Avenue. 
on a large double wide lot. As you can see, the house was significantly set back from East Island Avenue with a large side yard and the existing garage uh, set towards the rear of the lot facing on the East Island Avenue. The applicant is requesting to demolish a later 1934 rear two-story sunroom addition and back patio area, uh, which was the back patio area was constructed in 1968-69, uh, which is attached to the primary structure and replace it with a new two-story and one-story rear addition with attached so here you can see the site plan of the existing zone lot on the left and the overview of the proposed work on the right outlined in blue. Additional site work will include a new small site addition to the existing garage on the site a new pool, patio area, covered patio structure with an outdoor fireplace, as well as the new addition that's at the rear of the primary structure. Other alterations include new mechanical units, new window wells, and a new railing at the front of the deck. And so at the top here, outlined in blue, is the proposed changes to the front facade. As you can see, they are minimal and have not changed at all from the previous submittal the commission saw on the January 24th meeting. The proposed changes include new lighting, new scuppers for drainage of the porch, and new handrails up the stairs. Here you can also see the extent of the rear addition that will be visible from the front spot, which is only the one-story garage portion of the addition. The garage addition will be at the far back of the lot and will be minimally visible. So here at the bottom, you can see the previous proposed design from the January 24th meeting with the new proposed design outlined in blue at the top. The 1934 rear sunroom addition will be removed and the new two-story and one-story addition will be added in its place. The roof design of the two-story addition has been changed from the previous gable roof design to a hip roof design to better integrate with the design of the historic structure. Per the Commission's previous comments in relation to Design Guideline 3.8, which states that the roof of the new addition should be compatible with the original structure and surrounding historic context. The two-story and one-story additions are also lower in height than the existing structure and will be minimally visible from the front facade. At this elevation, you can also see two existing vinyl windows on the historic structure are proposed to be changed to aluminum clad wood, single hump which will better match other windows on the existing structure. The proposed railing of the front facade is also shown here, and you can see it has been simplified from the previous horizontal design that was shown on January 24th. So here at the bottom again, you can see that previous proposed design from the January 24th meeting with the new proposed design in blue at the top. Uh, here you can see the two-story portion of the addition will be clad in that James Cardi shingle siding, straight edge, and the one-story portion will be entirely clad in summit brick, the bonfire color at the attached garage, and at the one-story addition portion of the house. The materials have also been simplified from the two brick colors previously shown to just one brick color and one area of shingle siding on the addition. Per the commission's previous comments in relation design to design guidelines, 3.6, which states these materials that appear similar in color, scale, texture, finish to those historically on the primary structure, and also from that same guideline, uh, point H, I believe, says to state to avoid uh, using a wide range of different building materials when buildings in the surrounding contracts typically use a simple combination of materials. Additionally, the clear story windows of the one story portion of the admission have been changed for the commission's previous comments in relation to design guideline 3.7, which states to design windows, doors, and other features on the addition to be compatible with the historic primary structure and historic content. So here at the bottom, again, you can see the previous design and at the top, the new design. The new addition will be differentiated from the primary structure and easily recognize the current construction with a two-story inset connector at the rear that transitions to a one-story addition and attached garage. The additions will be differentiated from the contributing structure with a change of material 
from brick to shingle straight edge siding of the two-story portion of the addition. The new addition will not be visible, very visible from public vantage point um, and is subordinate to the historic structure. Here you can see the small shed roof addition on the existing detached two-car garage, as well as the new covered patio structure, outdoor fireplace, and the new pool and patio area. All of these alterations will be minimally visible from public, public vantage points as the yard is enclosed with an existing privacy fence. And then these are some isometric views of the revised design at the top, outlined in blue, and you can see the previous design below. The proposed changes are compatible with the existing structure and will be clearly recognized with current construction and have addressed the Commission's previous comments. Therefore, staff is recommending approval. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? All right. Um, can we promote the applicant for the chair first? Okay, great. All right, please put your name and address for the record. Sounds good. Uh, Andy Baldiga with the Moldering Group Architects, uh, 1400 Blue Arm. Sorry. <laughs> the, is it possible to show the See, there are one of the elevations that show the, the isometrics of the four pages. You put that in there? No, I just have the one. So just one. the comparison one? Yeah. Okay. But they have that in their office. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, okay, so then we can go. I just wanted to draw the attention to the page AB 3.00. Um, we added a couple of perspectives in there, primarily one the southwest view in the lower right hand corner um, to highlight the relationship and to better um, address some of the concerns that were brought up previously in our presentation, uh, primarily that relationship between the existing historic garage and the uh, new single story addition with the gable bay. Um, those have been, uh, I've seen myself just bothersome right there. <laughs> So we added that to give everyone a better perspective. This site has quite a large yard, and it's a very large yard. So we've been looking at it, and it's the whole property is just third, including the garage. We've been looking at it as and that being part of the entire context. I'm trying to better show that relationship between the historic building, the additions, uh, the, 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 the addition, and then the historic garage, and then that future school um, addition. We've also added, as far as one of the previous comments, well, I'll keep going through there and just point out the. Um, thank you, Crystal, for doing a great job on summarizing our our comments in the last month and getting us back on the agenda. We appreciate it. Um, the use of materials, we've taken your comments and reduced the number of materials down to just two, uh, the brick and the uh, shingle siding. The siding color will be likely be similar to the one that's on the existing building, and the brick color will be a red that's compatible as well. Um, those angled windows that were noted as not compatible on the addition with the gabled end, we reduced, remove the angled windows and just have that transom with a pair of French doors uh, on that uh, great room addition to better relate to the historic building in the one over one pattern and more historic context uh, relationship between the addition, the garage and the historic building. Uh, the roof design, uh, you know, that actually this we think worked out probably uh, better, you know, with the hip roof element. So we think in this case, thanks commission for the comments because we do like that second story addition um, better with the historic or with the hip roof element rather than the gable band. So um, we did not have any, once we tried it out, we didn't have any opposition to that. Um, just draw your attention to the, we added um, a second sheet with possible street exposure. Uh, it's also labeled AD 3.00. I apologize if that was in our rush, but it's basically just, there was a question brought up, what is, 
what is the visibility of the site uh, in the winter. So in January, it was cold and snowy. We went out there and um, the site is very heavily wooded. And even in the winter, we were looking at some of these pictures. We've got a lot of evergreen. So you can see the uh, existing historic house there in the red brick and the existing historic um, garage. But our addition would you know, be slightly visible in, in the distance, but not very uh, prominent at all. The view is from both Milwaukee and there's numerous views from Islas because this is a corner property. We do have some unique perspectives into that backyard, even from the alley side, um, which is kind of where these two um, trash and recycling bins, that rear fence is going to be replaced uh, it's in disrepair at, the time, at this time. So that whole area will just be cleaned up, and be very compatible with the existing structure. And Oh, and then there was the one other one. The one other comment, I think we did update our 8.03 sheet to better reflect the comments relating to the demolished versus the window opening. Um, you know, we had previously shown uh, just the windows being demolished, and this more accurately represents graphically the second story addition, sorry, the second story has sleeping porch addition from the 60s, and that porch that will be removed. But the window opening, um, will be retained, even though some of them are going to be covered up. So even within the historic interior of the building, those ex existing window openings will remain uh, once we've completed the interior finishes. So um, hopefully, that, uh, hopefully that addresses many of the com comments and concerns that the commission had. Uh, we do thank you for your comments because we do feel we have a stronger project. Um, but we look forward to approval this time around so we can start construction on it. If it's, if it's, uh, so please, this is the commission. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right, are there any questions for the applicant? I just have one question. Um, thank you, by the way, for your responses to what we talked about before. Uh, the new attached garage has some brick detailing that, from what I can see from the photos, doesn't really seem to be part of the existing house. Can you talk a little bit about your thought process with that? Uh, yes, the exist, it, you're absolutely right. It doesn't, but it, we tried it without any detailing, and it seems to be extremely plain. Um, so we tried to introduce just some basic row locks and a simple fill uh, just to since we're using brick, just to accentuate the material and use the material in what would be a more historic, traditional way, um, we didn't really want that portion of the building to be as contemporary as the portion with the gable band. Um, so feeling like, and feeling that since it was concealed from view, mostly from the rest of the historic building and it's that far apart, you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't detract from the historic building. So that's Yes, we struggled with that or had that discussion internally and went with, let's, if we're going to use brick, let's make it look beautiful, um, but not compete with our other elements. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. 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 Not seeing any hands. All right. Um, then let's go ahead and move into deliberation. And I apologize for the speaker. You're welcome to move up further. That's okay. It's worked well to be. I've been watching for for a while. So it's worked well <laughs> from the viewers. Because <laughs> we hear that we're quiet, so <laughs> we're just trying to address that. So George, just step out. that it um, might have been disappointing 
to have had the denial previously, but that um, they feel that this design is um, stronger, I would agree. I think um, addition is much more subordinate, um, clearly contemporary, but um, just fits better with this individual landmark, um, especially with the um, more simplified materials and roof lines. Um, that are just kind of more cohesive. Um, that's my general, that's my kickoff on it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a much improved uh, response in terms of subordination and compatibility. I, I was not here last time, but um, I think this looks great. I think it clearly meets the guidelines. And um, when can I move in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think it I think it looks great. I agree. It doesn't it doesn't look like it's trying to resemble the historic. It's kind of got a connector piece that separates it. I I did look back at the first application to kind of see what had changed and um when I saw this, you know, it had been denied before and I do think that that hip roof is a huge improvement and looks great. Uh, and I also think the simplification of the material looks really um, compatible with the existing home too. So I, I think it meets the guidelines. I agree. It's a lot cleaner, very attractive. Yeah, I do believe it meets that guidelines. Yeah, I agree. And my question around the um, the brick detailing wasn't necessarily a point of contention, but. Yeah. Just was curious about it, and I think it is uh, as well demonstrated by the additional photos um, of the site. I think it will be well out of sight, and so not really any concern around that. Yeah, it still retains so much of the open space on the lot. Yeah. I, I think it's the right location. If you're going to do an addition on the property, it seems to be the right spot. Great. Well, it Sounds like we're all in agreement, so who's going to make the motion? I'll make the motion. I made the, I think I made the motion to deny it. <laughs> uh, I move to approve application number 2023-COA-041 for the rear addition at 2288 South Milwaukee Street as per design guidelines 2.19, 2.38, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, 3.10. Present testimony, submit a documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Second. Great. Thanks, Erica, for the motion. And Larry for seconding. Yes. Yeah. George, you can't vote on this since you were gone for the deliberation. Oh. So, oh. It's up to oh. George if he wants to vote. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Didn't know that. So, like we have a motion of a, or for approval. Oh, so like I thought of you step out, but you can't. There's I, I mean, if, okay. question for George if he's reviewing material, yeah. if he's confident. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then, um, with that motion, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, against or no, I'm turning off. Okay. <laughs> I have my little routine. I'm turning off my game. Uh, anyone opposed? Abstain. All right. So the motion passes unanimously, and the project is approved. Great. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Good luck moving forward. Thank you very much. We well, do have to hang out for the next. Well, sure, feel free. Uh, join the party. Uh, all right, so we have one more project up for design review, and that's 2023-COA-043 uh, at 1622 Emerson Street. I'm trying. I keep getting a message saying you cannot start your video because the host stopped it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, host. <laughs> <laughs> asked to start video. There we go. I asked you to start. Video. Okay. That's fun. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. 
Okay, everyone. So this is a design detail application for a multifamily infill at 1622 Emerson Street. Uh, this is located in the Swallow Hill District. Uh, so the infill will feature a flat roof, simplified brick cornice, front porch, balconies, and a projecting bay on the facade. All features found on other multifamily buildings within the district. The facade of the building will be clad in red brick. The brick will wrap around the corners and extend along part of the north and south facade. The remainder of the building will be clad in stucco. The exposed foundation will be cast stone. Decorative banding will wrap the building at the window sills. The banding will be in brick and in stucco, depending on the section of the wall it's on. The projecting bay on the facade will be framed by wood blasters. Cast stone lintels and sills will be used as windows. The porch will be enclosed by a brick wall with a roof supported by wood columns. Um, so, overview there. And here is the rear, so you can see the rear section in stucco. So this would be the view that is from the alley. Um, as we're getting into this, I just wanted to give you a slight, a quick uh, summary kind of, of what changes have been made since you looked at it before. So there on the left, you have what you were approved during the mass form and context review. And then on the right, you have what is up now for the design detail. Um, so overall, pretty much the same concept, but you can see some changes have been made to the fenestration. Um, so the fenestration has been simplified and a lot of the transoms have been removed. Some of the window openings have also been shortened. So where you kind of had tall old size ones before, they're now shorter windows. Um, also at the porch, you have um, the stone that kind of formed the cap stone formed the porch wall has been changed to brick. That was at the suggestion of staff, which felt like the first of more typical material for um, to use that porch on the wall. So yeah, I think those are yeah, those are the main changes. The staff doesn't have any concerns with any of those changes. We feel like you know, additional simplification um, works for infill, but wanted to kind of give you overview of what has occurred since the last time you saw this project in the design. Uh, so here you can see the side views. So you can see that the front, uh, kind of the front three bays on one side, a little bit more on the other side, are clad in brick. Um, so it has a pretty good wrap of brick. Before then, um, the rest of it will be clad in stucco. And you can see there those kind of three-part bands um, that continue across. Um, so located space the windows and extended. Are both done in brick and then will be done in stucco in that section. Uh, so here you have uh, the streetscape to you know, look at how it fits within the context. So uh, Swallow Hill District that it's located in includes a lot of elaborate examples of Queen Anne architecture, um, as well as more restrained designs. Uh, the district includes a mix of single-family residences as well as multifamily. Uh, so the proposed infill is drawing inspiration from the other multifamily residences, but also really working to fit within the context of the adjacent single-family residences. Uh, the property that you see there to the uh, left is another multifamily building, and that is on the same zone lot. So these two will be on the same Lot. So if you wonder, like, there's a pretty small setback there. And when I show you the, uh, the site plan, there's a courtyard that will be there. So those are, this is not an infill that's on its own zone lot, as we usually see it is on the same lot with that adjacent building uh, to the left. And so they were very, you know, really trying to kind of echo things such as that, where that um, inspiration of having some of that banding is echoed from some of the banding that you see on that building to the left. So here then, as you can see, um, entry features that are planned. So you have a planter that will be planned along the new front walkway and planter front. And then you'll have a small courtyard area that will be located there between the two buildings within um, parking that will be at the rear. So 
overall, staff find uh, the you know, proposed design details to be successful. Um, and that the infill relates to the district. We just have concerns about some of the materials that are proposed and some of the window detailing. Uh, so currently the application states that the SECO um, will be three coat and smooth, but currently the products is that are acrylic. Um, the applicant did let me know that this was a mistake and they will be correcting this um, to include a concrete based SECO, but have that as a suggested uh, condition uh, since the acrylic base does not meet our guidelines. Um, you can see there then that's the brick that they're proposing, colonial satin, smooth red brick, that by that to be a very compatible choice with the district. Uh, we do then have some concerns about the cast stone that is proposed. Um, so the cast stone that is being proposed is a cast stone veneer that is over a foam core. So you can see here that the cast stone is just uh, three quarters of an inch thick and is going to be over foam. That's concerned about this durability, particularly because unlike the question we had, you know, the kind of foam material we had earlier that was going to be up high, this is going to be used as a foundation and windowsills and other. And so we're really concerned about the appearance and durability of that having it just that thin um, stone veneer over foam. So staff would recommend that this be more of a you know, cast stone without the a thicker cast stone, traditional cast stone without um, having the foam. And then you can see then on the opposite side here, also some concern with the window inset. Um, so the window does not appear to be showing inset here. I mean, it's inset from the sill, but it appears to be, at, you know, flush with the wall plane. And the guideline does say that it's supposed to be inset um, from the wall plane, and it does not. It seems in this to me um, it seems to be showing it being um, not having any success from the wall plane. Uh, so other staff. So the applicant is also requesting that the LTC uh, support um, an application they're going to be making to the board of adjustment um, for the required bill to. The required bill to, according to zoning, um, would be 19 to 20 feet back from the primary street zoning lot line. You can see here that would place it at this kind of dotted red line that is right here. So that would be placing it forward of where it currently is now. And that would be placing it forward of the adjacent property, as well as forward of several other of the properties that are on the street. Um, so staff does not find this to be appropriate. We don't think it would meet guidelines. 4.2, which says uh, the new building should respect the alignment of historic building facades and entrances. Um, our 4.2a, located new building to reflect established setback patterns of the surrounding context block. So we feel where they have it at now, which is where it was also in the mass forming context that you approved earlier, we feel this is the most appropriate location because it is in alignment with the rest of the block. Um, so staff would recommend that we commission support. Um, variance here to the BOA so that they can place it here where it's aligned with the other um, properties on the block and the adjacent one instead of needing to face it forward, which people wouldn't meet the guidelines and would make it more prominent rather than kind of helping it blend into the block. So the staff is recommending approval, recommending approval with the condition that the SECO be cementitious, cast stone to be solid rather than a stone from your foam, and the windows to be inset at least two inches from the wall plane. Um, and then we'd also recommend that you support the request, um, the request to the board of adjustment. So, are there any questions for Sam? Um, did you get any feedback from the applicant regarding your requirement to go to full depth, I mean, non foam back cast off? Yes, you know, the, as the staff wasn't supportive of that, but he. He didn't have it because I. But he that's the uh, that's the preferred material that the applicant would like. To use. Right, but he hasn't 
I'm asking for his reaction to your uh, comment about it. Because looking at his details, he's going to have some difficulty supporting real cast stone on the structure that he's got detailed. Yeah, I mean, applicant, I mean, that's the wants to use it because they really want to have that detailing. Right. Um, they want to have the appearance of cast stone. Because staff had also recommended that they could just use brick and a concrete foundation right. would be appropriate with the district. It wouldn't have to be. If you see here, it's a pretty that it's a pretty tall cast stone foundation here. So staff had also said that you know if they didn't want to have to use a true cast stone, that they could make that you know, it could be brick within a smaller just a concrete foundation or small brick or, you know, that there were other options, but I know that they really did want um, that appearance of cast stone, but wanted to use that. Um, but it's also being the, detailed in other locations. Yes, on the window sills yeah. as well, and window sills and headers as right. well. Okay. But the site walls were actual cast stone and not the cupboard itself. So. I believe, but yeah, I think the cat, the site walls, I think, are concrete with, um, yeah, over with with a cast stone or a stone veneer. Yeah, over concrete. Yeah. Okay. Related question, I guess, to that. Um, I don't think I've come across this so far in my time on the commission. Can adhered stone be approved, or does it need to be full depth this year for these guidelines? That and usually we don't approve any type of veneer products. We ask for things to be full depth, probably. Yeah. But it has more the that the guideline we talked about previously about having the real appearance of historic materials and also concerns about materials with durability. Okay. These are things like we don't allow like thin veneer brick because it wouldn't have the same depth. Yeah. That's, you know, yeah. Like, no, like, exactly. yeah. Use the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions for staff? All right, let's go ahead and promote the applicant. No, you're sure. Yeah. But I can't. Let me do it over there. Oh, because I still, um, oh, I got it. Already then just if you're allowed to talk if they don't move over. So sometimes sometimes you will get stuck in the back end. There we go. We get the software issues or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. So I think you're able to unmute yourself. Maybe you're already unmuted. I can't tell. Um, yeah. But you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Please start with your name and address for the record. Okay. Hi, this is John Buchanan. I'm the design architect for the project. My address, is, my business is John Buchanan Design Associates Architecture. And my uh, business address is 1550 Larimer Street, number 422, Denver, Colorado. I want to thank the commission for their comments uh, in our previous review. We took those to heart, and I think we've... Um, made some good improvements as well as the comments that we have gotten from uh, the staff over the time period since we last talked with you in February, I believe it was. And, um, you know, I think the project has uh, benefited from all of that input. As uh, Abigail noted, um, that was an error on my part. I had corrected the uh, color specification for the uh, cementious Portland or the cementious stucco that we had uh, in mind and uh, didn't correct that on the drawings that I submitted her. So we do plan to use Omega Color Tech, which is a Portland based uh, product. Um, with regard to the window setback, um, we've been looking at that and our proposal to uh, address that is in the stucco areas, we would increase the one inch um, 
um, layer of uh, insulation, uh, foam insulation, rigid foam insulation to two inches. And that, that plus the uh, seven eighths inches of um, the Portland based uh, stucco would give us uh, a minimum of uh, one and seven eighths inches, if not in fact, two inches at every location that there's a question about that depth. With regard to the uh, use of this uh, cast stone product, um, the staff had uh, in previous conversations, uh, recommended stone or cast stone. Um, we like the idea of the, the cast stone or stone for the base of this project because it is resonant with so many other projects uh, in the Swallow Hill District, whether they're uh, single family residences or multi-family residential projects that have a stone base to them. Um, that was in part our preference for it. The other part is that uh, we found in our research that this product really um, you know, fit a lot, ticked a lot of the boxes, if you will. One, um, the foam core is um, EPS, extruded polystyrene, which is very durable. Uh, as many on the commission may know, it's often used as um, foundation insulation. And studies have shown that that insulation over time uh, actually stands up incredibly well and becomes more dense. Now, I don't expect that this product would become more dense, but it just points to the, the um, quality of the product that's being used. The process is the same as producing any other cast stone in that it's a limestone with a matrix that's pressed into a form. In this case, it has this foam core. Another advantage to the foam core is that um, it makes the product lighter. So, you know, it's easier to handle on site. It's less costly to ship, which reduces uh, greenhouse emissions in getting the product to the site. And it's also, um, because it is insulation in those areas that we're using it, uh, gives us uh, continuous insulation, which adds another uh, insulative factor to the, the uh, uh, exterior walls where we're using it. Um, it is uh, has been shown to be very durable. Currently, the warranty uh, is 15 years, and the owner of the company has a product project that uh, where they first installed it, and every year he looks at it, and if it's still holding up, he extends the warranty another year. Um, We also the product when in our research we found that it had been widely used, uh, including uh, historic restoration of the um, what were stone elements of a historic bank in Logan, Cal in Logan, Utah, the Zion Bank, and they uh, found that they could uh, use these this product and recreate that entire column uh, structure and the lintels and um, portico above it. Um, it's also been used in very high-end projects like uh, Regis, uh, St. Regis Hotels, Four Seasons Hotels, including the St. Regis Hotel at Deer Valley, which goes to you know, the durability in our mind of the product in that it's being used in, an, in a location where you have high uh, freeze-thaw cycles. Uh, much of what we would expect to have here, though less so. Um, this product is also adhered to the underlayment by a uh, simple thin set, which you know makes it for a very durable bond. Um, there are other numerous retail and residential projects around the country and in Europe where this project product has been used very successfully. 
I think that's all I have to say about this product. I think with th that information and, um, you know, we did have a much discussion with the staff about this. We provided staff as much information as we could to um, provide them an understanding of how the product's made and its uh, character and quality. And uh, so with that uh, and the our agreement that, you know, that was a mistake that we didn't change on the drawing, the uh, Portland cement um, stucco, and that uh, we will address that um, setback to, for the windows by adding an inch layer, an additional inch of uh, insulation. Those three things that we would request the um, commission approve our project, um, and we'll make those corrections. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Um, I have I have one for you. So I'm looking at the capstone detail. Um, it's detail six on sheet D D27, and um, <clears throat> it's showing the capstone transitioning to um, uh, the stucco above. And I'm wondering, I may have just missed it. So do you also have a detail of the capstone transitioning to the brick? Where that happens in this set? Um, yes, we do. Um, let's see. I apologize. I may have just nope. not no noticed. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we have it um, on DD30, uh, drawing number two. And the transition in all those cases is with a lintel or a sill between the brick and the window opening. Gotcha. Um, and then where there's not, oh wait, so it's section two. Okay, I see. All right. So those pieces are much thicker. <laughs> The, the section that I was. Yes. Um, okay. And then I was wondering, you had mentioned that, you know, since it's extruded, I think I got this right, extruded polystyrene, right? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So that it acts as part of your continuous insulation. But as you transition to brick or stucco above it, um, I mean, you then don't have that depth of that added extruded polystyrene. So do you, is it, I mean, your continuous insulation is really the rigid you're showing behind it, right? You're not counting that this cast stone product towards your continuous that, insulation. Yes, that, yes, you have that correct. It's, my pointed out is really an ad additional benefit um, of the yeah. product. Not, not a essential part of why we're why we're using it. It's a it's an okay. a, a plus. Okay. Got it. That was my question. Any other questions for the applicant? That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, is there anyone on the line who would like to provide a comment on this project? If so, please use the hand raised button at this time. That's okay. um, any retail? All right, let's move into deliberation. Uh, what did everybody think? If, if we wanted to break it down by conditions, we could go through that. Um, it, it seems that the overall design is consistent with what was approved in the phase one mass forming context. It looks great. Um, you know, some minor administration changes, but I think staff fully explained that that's pretty consistent with the mass form context review. Great. So let's. Um, so the conditions sounds like they're going to address the stucco. 
which in turn addresses the windows. So that kind of hits two of those conditions right there. Um, it's really this stone uh, product that I think there warrants some discussion here. What was everybody's thoughts on that? I can jump in yeah. since I brought up the question about um, flick and stick. Um, and that's, I think that's another component of this discussion, in addition to the fact that it's the cast with foam integral to it, is that what they seem to be proposing is flick and stick, except for where it is under the brick. But even there, it seems like that would be the installation method. It would just be a sort of paper profile um, versus a veneer that is that has its own foundation and has an airspace, which in my view, yeah, that's a critical, that makes a critical difference for longevity, um, having that type of installation. So I think, and I guess what I would say too with that is I would recommend adding full depth to the, um, to the second condition, full depth cast zone. Exactly. Other commissioners agree on that? Yeah, I mean. And they, it's full depth. We're going to add their cast stone to be solid rather than stone material foam at full depth. It would be full depth cast stone. Well, yeah, I okay. guess the grammar of that is kind of off. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I kind of, it, it could still be considered a veneer, though, like based on the thickness. So I guess full depth, I don't know if, whether we need that term or not. I, I don't know. Well, if we are proving this using the details they've submitted, and, and we say, Real cast stone um, rather than foam filled. Um, I think it kind of covers the, yeah. the depth issue. For example, I mean, I'm just looking at a detail where they've dimensioned a stone trim over a window opening, and it's dimensioned eight inches by seven inches. Mm -hmm. And if we say real cast stone, that kind of talks about the full depth issue. I think I know what your concern is: is that if they elect to use a thinner stone and adhere it mm -hmm. instead of what they detailed, yeah. that would be a problem. Well, and it does seem like in the sections that are at the stucco, which I think you had pointed out, Kelly, um, those do appear to be quite thin. Like they are very thin. Yeah. What sheet was that? Twenty six. Um, yeah, DB twenty seven is detailed six. Uh, and it looks like they're, I mean, less than this dimension is two and a quarter inches, where it's at kind of the bell course, if you will. So, I mean, the panels below that would be even thinner. So, that would be a very yeah. thin product. So, it would right. be actually a three quarters because it's. The reveal is actually dimensioned as three quarters. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, I think the condition as stated, as proposed, kind of addresses the issue. Um, you know, that particular detail for that to be full thickness cast stone would have to be not one big panel. It would have to be divided into smaller pieces and the anchorage would change. I mean, I think there's some, to comply with the condition as proposed, I think it's going to require some redetailing the exterior. Um, which I'm not objecting to. Um, so that'll that'll mean that when the 
detailed submittal comes back, staff will be struggling with whether those revised details satisfy our intent or not, um, I think. About that. I mean, I think as soon as I mean, as long as I get the concern about thin and the concern, so I mean, I think as long as it's to me, as long as it's shown on the read detailing that it will be more a traditional deck product that isn't just a thin veneer that I think is something that staff could review. And then, if it's Yes, yeah, and if we're unclear, we could always come back. But I think it's something that, I mean, I, I think listening to deliberation, I have a pretty clear sense. Yeah. Are you thinking about maybe actually defining what a minimum thickness should be? No, not necessarily. I just wanted to bring up the point yeah, no, of that. Yeah. It was kind of, it's different than the foam right. component. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so, I mean, the way we're talking, it kind of sounds like everybody agrees with the staff recommendation right that we're getting it yeah okay so um the you know applicant has said you know this is a high quality it's not just foam it's extruded polystyrene and um that the limestone's pressed into a matrix with this mold and they have a 15 year warranty so um i mean i i hear all that and i'm i'm happy that the applicant gave us that context for the product um but I do just worry looking at these details. That is a very thin layer of limestone, <laughs> and I just um, I don't I don't think I've ever seen us approve. I mean, I feel like that kind of sets a dangerous precedent because I don't think I've ever seen us approve anything like that, and I just don't have a clear confidence in how that's going to perform. Um, but I would agree with what, you know, Abby said earlier, you know, it doesn't even have to be that it's stone. They want it to be stone. It could be brick, you know, that would work and fit within the context as well. So if that helps the applicant give them better flexibility and if they want to pursue changing that, I think that's acceptable as well. So I saw a lot of nodding heads. So if, if that's kind of the extent, um, the only other thing that we didn't talk about was the zoning um, board of adjustments recommendation. I think that makes sense. We don't want it to be proud of the historic right. product. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, was there anything else we need to discuss or comments on this one? Then it sounds like we're moving towards um, using the staff suggested motion. Someone would like to make the motion? Sure. I'll make a motion. Great. Madam Chair, I move to conditionally approve application number 2023-COA-43 for the design details of the infill at 1622 Emerson Street as per design guidelines 4.5, 4 4.7, 4 4.8, 4.22, 4.25, character defining features for the Swallow Hill Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, stucco to be cementitious. Two, cast stone to be solid rather than a stone veneer over foam. Three, all windows to be inset at least two inches from the wall plane. I also move to recommend that to the BOA that a variance be approved for the bill to violation per section 12.4.7.5C of the Denver Zoning Code, finding that conformance to the requirements of the Zoning Code would have an adverse effect upon the historic district. Thank you, Larry. Second. Thank you, Gary. All right, we'll call to the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? All right, motion passes unanimously and the project is conditionally approved. Um, Great, so that's the last project on our design review agenda today. If you have any discussion or business items, all right. So um, I'll go ahead and close the meeting. It's uh, 3.59. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.